I might really have to eat my words now. I'm playing through Baldur's Gate 3 with a full party of rogues just to prove that they are one of the weakest classes in Baldur's Gate 3. And so far, this has been proven pretty accurate. Rogues are fine when it's just one or two in a party, and the party has other members to tank damage. But when it's just a rogue on its own, or a full team of them, they really struggle. Now this is because they require early attacks of opportunity and prefer to surprise their enemies. A lot of combat in Baldur's Gate 3 happens out of dialogue, meaning they don't get these advantages at the start, making some fights really difficult. So how will my full party of rogues go in Act 3? Will level 12 and better items be enough to make a difference? Well, let's not dwell on it too much and get started right where we left off from Act 2. To kick things off, we long rested outside of Baldur's Gate. But while Don contemplated his sinister plans, we were attacked by Githyanki out of the strange portal. We were implored to enter the portal and help the Guardian who was inside. Knowing from past mistakes that I should ignore these guys and get through the portal as quickly as I could, I had a starry and misty step to the portal. Once we entered, we were met with a squad of Githyanki laying siege on a giant skull. We fought our way down and found an Elithid who said they were the Guardian and requested our help. We agreed to help them, then started fighting the Gith. With Don transformed, I was able to have Lazel and Shadowheart use Sneak Attack then Hide on the remaining Gith. And because our stealth had gotten so good, they could simply hide while in plain sight and then move slightly in case, you know, one of the Gith came looking for them, allowing us to take out the remaining Gith Yankee pretty easily. Now that that was taken care of, the Emperor revealed to us that he used to be an adventurer and was turned into a Lithid, but then somehow broke free from the Elder Brain's control. He asked us for our help in taking out the Absolute, and said that if we partially transformed into an Illithid, we would become even stronger. More power? Well, of course Don was in. This was going to be helpful with our party of rogues anyway. The ability to fly and transform into the Splacer Beast will be very helpful. Don accepted and he transformed, and now had the task of convincing the remaining party members to do the same. And surprisingly, we managed to get some good rolls, which meant that we had a full party of half Illithids, and I made sure everyone had the ability to transform into the Splacer Beast. Now it was time to head into Boulder's Gate. But before we did, I wanted to change up our feats a little. I found that what I was building previously wasn't very effective, so I respect everyone. For Don, I gave him the feats of Defensive Duelist and Mobile. Shatterheart, I also gave Defensive Duelist and Sharpshooter. Starion, I gave him Defensive Duelist and Mobile as well. And Lazel, I turned her into a Thief subclass away from Assassin and gave her Dual Wield and Medium Armor Mastery, hopefully to build her into a bit more of a tank with a higher armor class. Now that everyone was respect, we went down the hill to Baldur's Gate. The first thing we did was confronted the landlord trying to evict the squatters, and offered to get rid of them for cheaper than his current caravan guard were offering to do so. The caravan guard weren't happy about this and they attacked us. We did a fantastic job and managed to kill them pretty easily. We convinced the squatters to leave, then got paid. Next we went to the blacksmith to sell a whole bunch of junk, and also buy some stuff. I thought I would try and pickpocket what I could, and we managed to steal some new gloves and armor for Asterion. However, the shop owner was onto us and chased us around for a while. Now that we were all cashed up, it was time to go to the circus. We got in and made our way to the gin. Now I wasn't going to fall for his tricks, so we pickpocketed him and stole the mage hand ring that he had on him, then participated in his competition. Don had won the jackpot, but Jin wasn't having none of it. He transported Don to a faraway place riddled with these dinos. Thankfully though, Don could fly around the map, and his stealth was so good that they could, he couldn't even be seen at all, even when they were looking right at him. After all that, we did get this cool trident that nobody could use. Anyway. We then found this displacer beast that was about to break free from its cage, so we damaged its lock. Then watched the dribble show. He wasn't very funny, and Don isn't a huge fan of clowns. He simply refused when the clown asked him to go up on stage, which turned out to foil Dribble's plans as he called someone else up and then killed them. We suddenly had a fight on our hands, but without too much difficulty, we killed these guys pretty easily. Thinking that we've had quite enough of clowns for one day, we went next door to the church and discovered the father had been murdered. Don was quite fond of murders and wanted to look into it. We long rested at this point, and Skeletorus Fell appeared in Don's dreams. He told Don that he must reclaim his birthright as the child of Baal. This made Don very excited. The next day we continued the investigation of the murder and went down to the cellar under the church. Here we also released the spirit of the laughing medallion, and Don agreed to take on the curse, permanently giving him Tash's hideous laughter to cast. We found the buttons that led to the secret area and snuck up on the unsuspecting enemies who were arranging the corpses. We quickly killed them, then picked up one of the daggers for our final build, Steelmaker. We also found what we needed about the murders and continued on. We went downhill behind this church, continued past all these traps, and then stumbled across a fight about to brew between two gangs. One of them offered a scold, so we joined their side. Using Fly to give us a good height advantage, we helped the Nine Fingers gang kill the Stone Lord's gang members. After we helped kill them all, they mentioned there was something valuable in the boat, and that it was now owned by the guilds. They were of course wrong about this, so we turned on the guild members. Traitorous little gutter snipe! I'll cut you to awful! and found that all the other guild members but this one person had left. So it was a pretty easy fight. 
We looted all the parasites that we could find and made sure everyone had the ability Cull the Weak, which I figured would be super helpful for rogues, being somewhat of an execute ability. Apart from a few little things, there wasn't much else for us to do, so we continued to Worms Crossing. We weren't going to bother trying to get past the Steel Watch, so we found our way past by flying up the side of the bridge. In Worms Crossing, we entered the hostel to find a couple of Asterian's vampiric siblings, and we forced them to tell us where Cazadors was hiding, as if Asterian didn't already know. Is he hiding? Tell me! They told us where we needed to go, then ran off with their tails between their legs. While we were here, we investigated the room of the Red Dwarf and found his plans to kill them in the name of Baal. Don wanted to be a part of that, so we intended to hunt down this Red Dwarf. We then went across the Shares' Caress, where we agreed to meet Kithrak Boss. We met Carilla, who said that she's been keeping an eye on us and that Raphael was here to make a deal with us. We continued upstairs and stole what we could. In this room, we found an invitation to the keep, which will come in handy, and then interrupted a very steamy session, which quickly turned quite ugly. Well, that was an experience. After this, we went to Raphael's room. Boss was in there, but Raphael dismissed him. Raphael only seemed interested in dealing with Don. He offered us a way to free Orpheus, telling us the hammer that can free him is in the House of Hope. But in exchange, he wanted the crown of castles. We weren't going to give Raphael the crown, so we declined the offer with intentions to break into the House of Hope and steal it from Raphael and free Orpheus. Wait by it, and I admire you for it. Which, of course, we didn't disclose to the Emperor. Having nothing left to do here, we went to Worms Rock with our new invitation. We were allowed passage into Worms Rock, where we were then stopped by the Steel Watch. They were expecting us, and Gortash spoke through one, inviting us to the, his inauguration. Allow me to formally invite you to my inauguration. We agreed, and then we went upstairs. When we met with Gortash, he told us all of Don's backstory, strangely in front of everyone who was here at the inauguration, but anyway. He told us all about Don's sinister plot, and that it was all his idea. However, just as it was starting to kick off, he was taken out by Oren. Gortash wished to reignite our allegiance and rule the world together. Don agreed to help, though he didn't intend to rule alongside Gortash. We made our way back into Baldur's Gate. When we entered, we quickly pickpocketed the priest in Stormshore Tabernacle, then made our way to Elfsong Tavern the Book of Rome for us. As we went up to the room, we found out there was a murder investigation occurring here, so we joined in. But Don wasn't joining for the investigation side. He was there for murder. Anyway. We went downstairs to get to the Emperor's hideout. We went further in and found the Githyankui here. Having difficulty with these guys in the past, I wanted to make sure that we had the best chance of winning. So we went in stealth. I had everyone turn invisible, then Don and Shatterheart flew up to the left edge, while Astarian and Lazel flew up to the opposite side. My goal was to take out the Gith who had the portals open. They couldn't call in reinforcements. I started my attack with Don making the first move, doing good damage. However, when it was time for Shatterheart to make a move, I accidentally clicked on Don's profile while she had sneak attack open and she hit Don instead. This was a bit of a blunder, so I reloaded. Luckily, I quick saved while everyone was already set up. After reloading, I tried again. This time, Don killed the portal Gith in his turn and so did Asterion. This ensured there were going to be no reinforcements. Because we had surprised them, we were able to get two full turns in without too much response from the Githyanki. By the end of our third turn, we had done significant damage to them and killed another couple. They had started using Hold Person on Shatterheart and Asterion. Luckily, Don was able to kill the one who held Shatterheart, but unfortunately Asterion was still a sitting duck and was killed. Yeah. Sensing things were going to get tough, Don managed to do some massive damage to the Inquisitor before turning into Slayer form to help tank damage. Shatterheart also turned into Displacer Beast to also help soak up the damage, then we finished the Inquisitor off. With him dead, the remaining Githyanki were pretty easy to kill. This fight caused everyone to be level 10, giving us another feat. Don got alert, Shatterheart and Astarian got lucky, and Lazel got mobile. Now that that was taken care of, we continued downstairs to find that Yenna was running towards us. However, it wasn't actually Yenna, it was Oren, and she said that Yenna had been captured, and if we didn't take out Kortash first, Oren would kill her. Don didn't really care too much, he didn't really like kids, but he did want to duel Oren anyway. We long rested, and that night the Emperor came to us in our dream. They were bare to their pants, trying to be friendly, but Don didn't trust him. The Emperor then revealed that he was mind-controlling Duke Stelmane to allow him to be the one controlling Baldur's Gate from the shadows, and that he could just have easily done it to us. He said that we were his puppets, and without him, we had no value. Don was not impressed by this. He was going to make the Emperor eat those words. First chance he got. Once we woke up, we explored the sewers a little bit, killed this guy and all his grease monsters, and a few bar followers. We long rested again, and Astarian's children came to try and take Astarian back. This was actually a bit tough. We didn't land very many critical hits on them, and they kept healing themselves. After a long-winded fight that required everyone to become Displacer Beasts, we managed to fight them off. 
Next, we went to the wine festival, where the Red Dwarf was trying to poison some people. We weren't going to let him kill the target first, so we revealed his ruse, in which he ran away and made us fight his doppelgangers. After we fought them off, we proceeded into the middle of town and went to Sorcerer's Sundries. They were asking for information about the Night Cell. We of course had information, so Lorakin's projection invited us upstairs, and that's when we spotted the stock door. Of course, we stole our way in and worked out how to get the portal to open, which led to Lorakin's vault. We spent some time sneaking through the vault and stealing absolutely everything we could. We then went to Lorakin with information about Night Cell. I realized that Aelin might actually be useful in the last fight, so I decided not to give her up and convince Lorakin that she was actually dead. Dead? It cannot be. She, it, is immortal. A god. After that, we left and ran into Aridin, who swore that he would find her. Concerned he actually will, I didn't really want to put up with that later. So we went back up to Lorakim and attacked him. Don did some huge opening damage to him, paralyzing him in the process, allowing Lazel to kill him in the first round. By the end of the first round, we had also killed a fire Myrmidon as well. I had everyone grouped around the Myrmidons, allowing us to use sneak attack on them every turn, doing some great damage to them. However, Lazel had become quite weak, so I turned her into this place to beast to buff her up some. By the end of the fourth round, we had only one Myrmidon and a skeleton archer left. From here, things were pretty easy to wrap up. While here, we looted the remainder of Lorakin's stuff, although I didn't have a way to see invisible objects, so I couldn't release the magic sphere on the bottom floor. We left the scene of the crime and stumbled into another one, where Red Dwarf was about to kill his next victim. It's unusual for prey to supply the tools of its own butchery. We snuck in the wait for the right opportunity to attack and witnessed him kill the store owner. Unfortunately, the store owner's sacrifice was in vain as we were spotted and had the fight. Don's first attack paralyzed him, which gave us a huge advantage on the first round. And then Astarian one shot one of the doppelgangers while Lazel landed a massive critical hit on Dollar with her offhand attack, allowing her to finish him off in her turn. Once he was taken care of, the remainder of the doppelgangers were a walk in the park. We found this handbag on Dollar and instructions on how to get to the murder tribunal. So we made our way there. We waltzed in and we met with the murder tribunal. Saravok told us about who we were before Oren mutilated us. Your fall was as spectacular as your birth. We then pledged ourselves to Baal, killing Valeria the celestial being to become the unholy assassin of Baal. While here, we bought all the Baal equipment to kit Don out as the true assassin of Baal, including the Baalist armor, Baalist hood, and gloves, which all worked really well for his build. We explored some more and witnessed his shop blowing up to find our blood-obsessed drow friend. She said she wanted to do more experiments with our blood and gave us a potion saying that we might blow up. A potion that makes you explode? Seems a bit drastic. But if we didn't, we will get special powers. Don loves power, and so he drank the potion, which gave him the ability to explode occasionally if someone attacks him. Pretty handy. It was now time to set our sights on the biggest target here, the bank. Of course a party of rogues are going to raid the bank. We waltzed in and tried to talk our way in, which failed. So Shadowheart turned invisible and snuck upstairs to try and buy our way in. Unfortunately, she was caught, but luckily she could talk her way out of trouble. So Astarian finished the job by turning invisible and finding the vault pass, which allowed us entry into the vaults. We made our way down through the very lax security, looted all we could find in the first room, then went further down into the vault. In the vault room, Shadowheart flew past the teleportion traps and lockpicked the vaults to steal every bit of treasure we could. Then we completed the puzzle and continued further down into the high security vault, to only to find that someone had been here before us. We witnessed Minsk and Jahira run off with the gold from the vaults, leaving a whole bunch of ballast behind for us to find. The vault guards must have been very thankful for the assistance as they didn't bat an eye as we looted all the remaining vaults. Leaving with very heavy pockets, we decided that it was time to take on Kazador. We made our way to the tower, having to fight the guards at the top of the tower entrance, and proceeded inside. We quickly defeated Godi to get the ring for the enchanted door, then flew past the cursed body to get the book of translations before heading back upstairs and opening the door. Inside this door, it seemed that we had missed the party, so we cleaned up after them, removing all of the pests inside. We went down this elevator, then learnt about the ritual from the skull. Found this blade which does radiant damage, handy, and then proceeded to make her way to Kazador. I wanted to see if I could take him out quickly within a turn, so I got everyone to turn invisible, sneak up on Kazador, and then sneak attack him. However, once Astarian attacked, the cutscene started where Astarian was captured. This made Kazador stronger, and our party didn't survive the fight, so I tried again, this time without Astarian. On the next attempt, we all turned invisible and snuck in, all attacking Kazador right off the bat. However, we only managed to take out a quarter of his health in the first round of sneak attacks. The bigger issue now is the ghouls and skeleton. The ghouls use noxious gas, which cause their party to be nauseous if we were nearby, preventing them from being able to have an action. And if we were really unlucky, the ghouls attacks would paralyze us. And when half the party was affected by this, it became very difficult. So we have failed this attempt and tried again. 
The next time we attacked the ghouls first, taking them all out in the first round. However, we still had trouble with the skeleton mage. The skeleton mage also cast a spell which made us drop our weapons, and also put us to sleep, making things really difficult. To make matters worse, our displacer beast forms were useless as the werewolves were immune to bludgeoning damage. At the end of this attempt, Don got stuck in an attack loop, as Don would be able to attack a bat, turn invisible, and because everyone else was dead, the battle would end because nobody could find Don. All the enemies would heal to max health, only for Don to reappear again and the same thing would happen. So I had to reload. So I thought maybe it was time to start depending on spell scrolls. On my final attempt, I had the party focus on the skeleton mage first in the first turn. I then retreated everyone back to the entrance and cast AoE spells like Cloud Kill, Wall of Flame, and Cloud of Daggers to damage anything that made our way to us. The Cloud Kill was effective at damaging or stopping the werewolves coming through, and anything that tried to go around had to go through the Cloud of Daggers. The Wall of Fire was helpful for doing extra damage to ghouls, making them easier to deal with. Although I was silly and had Shadowheart use domination on a werewolf which cancelled the Wall of Fire. Though at this stage everything was adequately damaged. Blazel used Shrieking Blade which helped us do additional damage to everything around us. The ghouls were my number one priority as their noxious fumes were deadly, but with all the additional damage we were doing and with help from the dominated werewolf, we managed to take out the ghouls. Now all that remained were the werewolves and bats. Don was taken out by one of them, but we managed to revive Don and finish off the remaining werewolves. Now that all the threats were taken care of, we used Sneak Attack and Hide to critically hit Krasador down and eventually defeat him. We got Astarian back to the group and witnessed Astarian sacrifice all the vampires to become a Vampire Ascended and become all powerful. Feeling pretty good about our victory, we tried to leave, but the Gurs stopped us. They were not happy about Astarian's choice and attacked us, which was their mistake. Now that Astarian was basically a god, we went down to the sewers to try and chase down Minsk and Jahira. We killed the Balas outside their howdah, then waltzed in and attacked. Inside, Jahira's doppelganger and Minsk were cutting a deal with the Zentrum. We tried to make a break for it, but we weren't going to let them. We slaughtered everyone inside and collected our gold from the dead Zentrum's hands. We learned that the Zentrums were planning on attacking Nine Fingers, so we left to go to Nine Fingers' hideout to help out, hopefully getting Nine Fingers to join us in the final battle. We arrived and were let in the front door, where we witnessed the Zentrum ambush. We assisted the guild in wiping them out and secured Nine Fingers' assistance. Just tell me what you need to get us there. However, I then made a grave mistake by being caught pickpocketing Nine Fingers, which resulted in the entire place attacking and killing us. The major issue here, though, was that I hadn't saved before killing Jahira's doppelgangers, so we had to do all that again. So after doing all that again, we had caught up and we were now level 12, which meant more feats. So for Don, I gave him the ability improvement to increase his dex and wisdom to 18 and 14. Shadowheart got mobile, and Astarian and Lazel got alert. It was now finally time to do something about Gortash's Steel Watch. We then broke into the Steel Watch factory, easily destroyed the Watchers outside, and proceeded inside. We approached the Bane Worshippers and convinced the Gondians to fight for their freedom. For the glory of Gond! With all the extra help and massive critical hits, we made short work of the Bane Worshippers. We spoke to Tubin, who requested we save the Gondian families from the underwater prison before he would help us disable the Steel Watch. Without any other way to do this, we decided to go and help them. We made our way through the sewers and up this route to the submarine hangar, where Red Hammer agreed to take us down to the Iron Throne. We made our way down, but Gortash wasn't happy with us doing so, and blew the place up. When we arrived, the place was about to flood, so we had only a short amount of time to save everyone. Now, even though Don wouldn't really care if everyone was saved, I wanted to take on the challenge of saving everyone. So on our first turn, I had everyone turn invisible, use dash and fly to get around. Don flew to Duke Raven Guard's area, but didn't release him on his first turn. Asterion flew to the area where all the treasure was and managed to get there and loot it all within a single turn. It's handy when you can fly over the walls down here. Azel flew over to Amelum and made it to the chest and looted it. And then Shadowheart flew to all the way to the Gondians in prison in the opposite side of Duke Raven Guard's quarter. Now that everyone is in position, on the next turn, Don opened the doors to Duke Raven Guard and the Gondians in that wing. Then one shot the enemy there. Asterion went to the same room as Shadowheart, released one of the Gondian groups, and then shot one of the enemies, released the others on that end. Lazel released a Melium, flew over the wall and attacked the enemy in the hallway. Shadowheart then attacked the Sanguine in her turn and almost killed it. On the next turn, it was time for everyone to escape. On the way back, Shadowheart, Don and Asterion killed all their enemies in their wings, which allowed the Gondians and Duke Ravenguard to flee with, to safety without any problems. Things did look a bit spicy when Duke Ravenguard ran out of movement at the bottom of the ladder, preventing anyone else from getting up, but luckily he was able to get out of the way in the next round and everyone else could get up as well. This helped save time for everyone. I had Don go to Amelum, who on their turn used the power to teleport them both to submarines. 
Now, originally, I actually thought I had rescued everyone, and I was pretty happy about this, and I just moved on without thinking about it. However, there was a section on Amelum's side where Lazel just completely missed a couple people locked up, which I completely forgot about. So we didn't technically do this 100%, but I was happy about it either way. Now, with everyone rescued, we had secured Duke Raven Guard's help in the final battle. Plus, also received some stuff from Mamelum as thanks for saving them. With all the Gondians rescued, we went back to the Steelwatch factory to find the Gondians were in active revolt. We assisted the Gondians, including Tubin, by massacring the Bane cultists, then took Tubin further down to help liberate them. This was surprisingly hard. The sheer number of enemies combined with the Bane cultists' ability to dominate us was very difficult, and it took me a couple of attempts plus some lucky rolls to eventually defeat them. At this point, my party was pretty low on resources, so we left the factory and long rested before heading back down to fight the Steel Watcher Titan. This fight was pretty easy. The important thing was to do as much damage to the Titan as possible until it started its defense curl and started launching missiles around. From here, it was a matter of using invisibility, hide and sneak attack on the remaining Watchers until they're all defeated, and then finally destroying the Titan. Once the Titan was defeated, nothing was stopping us from blowing up the factory, except where was Tubin? I couldn't find him anywhere. I went back up to where we long rested and he wasn't there either. I then went back to camp to find that he was there and must have been left behind when we long rested. I managed to get him back into the party, then left the camp and also then found I couldn't talk to him. At this point, I was pretty worried because without Tubin, we weren't going to be able to blow up the factory. Thankfully though, restarting the game resolved this and I was able to get him to follow us downstairs, and then blow up the factory once and for all. Before we went to take on Gultash, I wanted to secure the hammer from Raphael. So we made our way to Devil's Feed to try and work out a deal with Halson. She revealed to us that she helped Don break into Mephistopheles' vault to steal the crown of Carsus originally, and would help us again if we paid her 20k gold. We weren't going to fork out that kind of money, and then tried to convince us to take us there by bringing something back for her, which also failed. But we did what rogues do best. We pickpocketed what we needed to open the portal, broke into her study, and then used the trial and error method which eventually opened the portal. Then we made our way to Raphael's House of Hope. When we entered, we were greeted by a projection of hope. We convinced her to help us find the hammer, and she implored us to release her. She then gave us disguises so we could explore the house without suspicion. We then entered the house and explored. We spent a long time trying to get past this infernal gem and eventually broke in and stole some of Raphael's treasure. We snuck around the backside of his bedroom and attacked Harley, the devil who was sleeping in the bed. This was an annoying fight because he could keep turning invisible, then using domination on one of our team members. Which wasn't good for us because we did so much damage to each other. Eventually though, we managed to defeat him and the imps that spawns. We found the spa which basically acted as a long rest and looted all we could find, including finding the password to get the Orphic Hammer. We convinced the archivist that we were meant to be here, then proceeded to disarm the traps and steal the gloves and amulet on display before we approached the hammer. I was hoping that we could do this sneakily and get out without Raphael coming, however it was not meant to be. I suspect it is impossible to steal the Ra hammer from Raphael without him knowing as when we took it we were told he was on his way back. Things were getting a bit spicy. We exited the room and attacked and killed all the enemies down the hall, trying our best to stay away from the flaming bulls. Although it wasn't Don's preference, we decided to save Hope as we will need all the help we can get to fight Raphael. We made our way to the secret entrance to where Hope was being held and was guarded by two spectators. From where we had entered, this was a great spot to do some initial damage and deal with the first spectator and imps without being knocked off or take too much damage. We then made our way to the opposite corner, being sure not to have an edge behind us, and slaughtered the remaining spectator. We freed Hope and made our way back to the main halls, and managed to destroy the flaming balls and remaining enemies in the dining room. Oh! Then we went back to Raphael's bedroom to long rest before facing the music and confronting Raphael. When we tried to leave, Raphael greeted us along with Yugo and Carilla, but we weren't going to back down from this fight, and we even managed to roll a nat 20 and convince Yugo to side with us against Raphael. To stand against a devil in his own home, hmm. that takes courage. I'm with you. And I'm glad I did. This was not an easy fight. So initially my strategy was to destroy these spires in the corner of the room. I tried to have Lazyel attack one of the spires to destroy it and hopefully make Raphael less powerful. However, she wasn't able to do decent damage to it. So I resorted to having everyone fight the Cambians. We eventually managed to kill them all off without any of us dying. This was thanks to a few healing potions along with Hope's healing spells. With the Cambians dead, I tried to ha have each of my party member attack a different spire but this proved ineffective. We couldn't damage them enough, and as soon as we one was destroyed, Raphael went into ascended form, where he one-shot Lazel. This continued on, and after a long battle, we were defeated by Raphael's ascended form. So I tried again. This time, I ignored the pillars, and the plan was to kill the Cambians 
and focused Raphael down. This attempt was going well until Hope was prematurely killed, which was a huge loss and basically impossible without any healing from her. So I saved. We tried again. This time, I focused our efforts on the Cambion, and I ensured Hope stayed a distance and primed to heal everyone on every turn. I had then had Don go into Slayer form to be a tank. I also ensured to keep the fight close to Don and so that everyone could use sneak attack every single turn. We kept up this pattern and on the fifth turn all the Cambians and Carilla were dead, leaving Raphael and the creatures he spawns. At this point, I used Hope's Divine Intervention which brought the whole party back up to maximum health and reset our skills, and then we brought the fight to Raphael. We surrounded him and dealt some massive crit damage with sneak attacks. While my party attacked Raphael, Yuga did as a solid and killed all the spawning enemies, which was super helpful. We had Raphael at a quarter health, but things were going a bit slow as he had really high armor rating, making him very hard to hit. However, Astarian's Susser Blade was working wonders, silencing Raphael and preventing him from casting any spells. For two solid turns, he couldn't do anything but run away. And then something amazing happened. Raphael tried to move away from Lazelle, and she landed a massive critical hit with her attack of opportunity, landing a whopping 110 damage bringing the devil down to 144 health. To top things off, we're all pretty much max health. We followed Raphael, who then tried the move away yet again, allowing us to deal another 38 damage. He was now on the ropes, and we were out for blood. We chased him down once more and brought him down to 19. Our last few attacks missed him. However, when he tried to use a spell on us, Don and Shadowheart's Psionic Backlash finished him off. We had done it, and in a very spectacular way. We were feeling good. We had just slain a devil, and we were feeling powerful. We marched straight to Gortash's tower, and slay the flaming fists who were defending the base of it. We went down to the prison and killed the guards and released Flory. Her help will be great in the final boss. We then snuck inside and flew up to Gortash's tower where he was hiding. We were level 12 at this point, so there's no point fighting unnecessarily. Inside Gortash's tower, I had everyone turn invisible, apply poisons to their blades, then surround Gortash before doing what rogues do best and sneak attack him. And in the first round, Gortash was at half health and he couldn't make an action because he was surprised. On round three, we brought him down to a quarter health and when it was finally his turn, he tried to move away from us, which triggered an attack of opportunity, causing everyone to bring him down to 26 health and the drought poison had put him to sleep. Oh, Gortash, you're screwed. All of Gortash's men had their chance to attack us. One even pushed Gortash to wake him up, but it was too late. On Lazel's next turn, she finished him off. We then quickly dispatched the remainder of Gortash's guards and reveled in our victory. Now that Gortash was taken care of, we explored the city a bit more. We found this group of people hiding in this abandoned building who made the mistake of attacking us. Then sought out the House of Grief. Upon entering, we were invited to complete the mapping of a heart. We followed inside, and something felt very trap-like. Shadow Heart completed the mapping of the heart, and then we were invited further down. Now descend. You have much to answer for. We proceeded down to this large audience chamber, where there are a lot of Sharon devotees around us. Now this definitely felt like a trap. Vicona de Vere requested we hand over the artifact. Obviously we weren't going to do that since we like staying not to mind flayers, so instead she asked if we would hand over Shadowheart in exchange for them to be our allies. Honestly, it was an entertaining thought, but Shadowheart was an important member of our group, so we refused, and then we were attacked. Now, this many enemies did have me concerned, but this turned out to be a really, really fun battle. The first priority was to take out the weakest enemies first and use invisibility to get into better position. Don was able to one-shot one of the initiates and turn invisible, as Darren Lazel took out another, and Shadowheart weakened another before the three of them turned invisible themselves. We moved up to the side of the map, well away from our last known locations, poised to strike. Obviously, no one could find us after searching for us, so combat ended, giving us a few moments to reposition ourselves a little bit better. Don was able to sneak attack someone, one-shot them, which turned him back invisible without trigger in combat, allowing him to do the same thing again to another unsuspecting enemy, healing them and turning invisible once again. This worked up until he attacked someone he, who he couldn't one-shot, initiating combat and forcing me to sneak attack with everyone before their invisibility ran out. However, we did manage to thin out their numbers from 21 to 16 before even completing a full turn. After this round, I made sure to have everyone hide in the shadows on the side of the map, making it hard for the enemies to spot us. And because we had surprised everyone by starting combat with these attacks, we had another free round. Don again was able to one-shot someone and turn invisible, as Darren lay Lazelle flew in range and sneak attacked an enemy and killed them before hiding again and flying back into the shadows. And Shadowheart cast Hold Person with her magic ambush advantage, holding two of the stronger Sharons to keep them out of combat for longer. Because we were well hidden, a lot of the enemies didn't do anything on their turn. And because we were on the other side of the map, the others had to dash to get close to us. The next round, Don was once again able to one-shot an enemy and turn invisible, while Lazelle and Asterion once again eliminated another weaker enemy at range. Shadowheart was in a bit of a sticky situation, but she was able to damage the enemy close to her, allowing her to move away 
away without giving them the attack of opportunity. On the next round, the enemy were upon us, which meant it was harder to sneak around. So Lazel cast Singing Sword and one-shot one of the enemies with her offhand attack with a huge crit. And with the bonus attack damage from Singing Sword, Asterion was able to kill another stronger enemy. Shatterheart then dominated another to help us with the fight. Things were looking very good for us. However, Don was caught out in the open after his last attack did one shot, and he was knocked down by two of the enemies and unfortunately was killed. But this didn't stop Lazel and Asterion wiping the floor with everyone, killing three within their turn, leaving the enemy side with five left, which included the one who was dominated. Lazel landed a massive critical hit, half healthing and stunning one of the remaining enemies, effectively removing them from the fight, allowing Asterion to revive Don. Then Shatterheart used Paralyze on the other, making them ripe for the picking. Unfortunately, Don was knocked down yet again, but we were pretty much had this fight in the bag at this point. The two stunned enemies were taken out, leaving only the one who was dominated and two others, including Viconia. And then Viconia wasted her turn using Detect Hidden Presence on Don after he turned invisible to escape. One of the other enemies tried to cast a spell on us, which allowed us to kill them with Psionic Backlash. This allowed us to finish Viconia and end the battle. Well, we did have to kill the dominated friend too. We proceeded to explore further into the temple to find Shadowheart's parents and allowed her to make the hard decision of letting them die to be freed of Shah's curse. Now that that was taken care of, there was very little to do but make her way to the Baal's temples so Don can face off against Iron to truly prove he was the true child of Baal. We entered the temple and flew across the gap to foil the ambush laid for us. Then defeated the fair slayer of Baal. We went further in and Skeletorus fell open the door for us, allowing us to enter the inner chamber where Don finally faced off against Oren. Oren talked big game, but she didn't know Don's secret. He already had Baal's blessing. Don transformed into the Slayer, triggering the duel, where Don shredded Oren in three turns. Don had done it and pleased Baal, who possessed Skeletorus' body and communicated his wishes to Don. Don accepted his birthright, granting him even more power, so long as he does as Baal bids, and secures the crown of Karsus and enslaves the world when the opportunity arises. Now that we had the three nether stones, it was now time to fight the elder brain. After long resting, we made our way down to the sewers where the nether brain resides and embarked on our boat. We made our way close to the brain and killed the intellect devourers that ambushed us, then approached the brain. It rose from the water where we were faced with the task of trying to dominate it with the nether stones. However, Don didn't roll well, causing him to fail at this. Requiring the Emperor to save us by taking us into the Astral Prism. Inside the Astral Prism, the Emperor revealed to us that the brain was no longer an Elder Brain, and it was now a Nether Brain, and that only an Illithid would be able to defeat it. He intended we give him the Nether Stones and assimilate Orpheus so that he can help us defeat the brain, but we weren't going to trust him with the stones, so we rejected his plan. After this, he was very quick to turn against us and side with the Nether Brain, and left us in the Astral Plane. We took the hammer and released Orpheus, who wasn't very happy about it, but he sided with us either way. He realized that the Emperor was correct and that someone had to be an Illithid so he would become one himself. To be honest, I wasn't expecting any of this. Either way, we needed his help. With Orpheus as an Illithid by our side, we went back to the Material Plane where the city was being decimated. Kithrak Voss came to us in rage, thinking we'd have betrayed him, only for him to be shut down by Orpheus. They vowed to aid us in the fight to come. We entered our final resting place, where all our allies had gathered. To be fair, this was a very ragtag group, but anyway, we were happy for all the help. After a fantastic and endearing speech from Don, to our freedom. We left to go and face the Elder Brain once and for all. After entering the city, we could see there were plenty of enemies to fight, so we had the party sneak up to the top of the battlements where we had a great vantage point. For this fight, I used a lot of AoE spell scrolls on the choke points to cull most of the weak enemies, and sneak attacked any of the strong enemies that made it to the group. And without too much difficulty, and with a little bit of time, we managed to kill them all. That was close. It was now time to scale the castle and get to the nether brain, which was actually quite easy. I had everyone turn invisible and flew and dashed up to the top of the tower. Because of the double bonus action, Lazel was able to make it to the door at the top of the tower in two turns, which teleported the whole party there and stopped us from needing to fight our way past all the mortars and enemies. Now we were here at the last part. I used potions of long rest and scaled the nether brain stem. We reached the top where the emperor met us with his projections of the guardians.
To start the fight, I used Lazel and Don's initial sneak attacks that cut the Emperor's health by half. Then Asterion and Shadowheart called in some reinforcements to help us. Our first priority was to kill the Guardians, then with them taken care of, kill the Dragon. Over the next turn, I had summoned everyone I could into the fight, which included Aelin and Yuga, who was super helpful. By the end of the fourth round, all the Guardians were dead, leaving the Dragon and the Emperor and all the Mind Flayers. We kept our distance from the Mind Flayers and focused on the Dragon, which was a little bit tough because of its reaction attack. While everyone was fighting the dragon, I had Asterion use a potion of haste and turn it visible to head to the Mind Flayers around the edge. During this fight, the Emperor got too close to Don and were able to damage him down past 80 health, which allowed Don to use the power to kill, which Baal granted him. Basically, this allowed him to execute the Emperor at 80 health, which felt like quite the fitting end to their relationship. We managed to stun the dragon, preventing it from using its reaction attacks, which allowed Don to finally slay it. Lazelle turned invisible and made her way to Asterion to help kill the Mind Flayers. Don was also invisible from killing the dragon and went with Shadowheart who was invisible to take out the Mind Flayers on the opposite side. The mi these Mind Flayers stood no chance against everyone being invisible and we quickly flew Orpheus up to the podium to cast a spell and open the portal to the Netherlands in a mind. Upon entering, everyone cast the strongest spell scrolls we had been collecting while also dodging all of the spearing floors. Then with one last of chain lightning, Shadowheart finished off the brain. The brain pleaded for its life while Orpheus struggled to finish it off. But this was it, the opportunity that Baal had said was coming. And just as I was beginning to second guess my actions, Asterion whispered in Don's ears. I know what you're thinking. So let's do it. Let's seize the whole damn world and be reviled together. And so Don drew his dagger and slew Orpheus and gained control of the Netherstones. Don gained absolute power over the brain and enslaved his team members into his new dominion of death where he reigns supreme. And that, everybody, is the end of this playthrough. In Baal's name. Admittedly, the evil ending is a bit hectic and honestly, a little bit sad and unsatisfying. But alas, this is roleplay and Don is, well, evil. But I'm glad I was able to experience this playthrough. It's been a real eye-opener to see the evil storyline, plus also being able to betray the Emperor. The full party of rogues turned out to be impressively strong. I almost think that they're stronger than the full cleric team I made. Either that, or I've just become better at the game. But let's just say they were super fun past level 11. I also think respecting them helped. If you watched Act 1 and Act 2 of this playthrough, you would have witnessed the pain I endured with my pre-level 10 rogue party. Being level 12, having full builds, and the use better use of invisibility and hide made all the difference in Act 3, and I thoroughly enjoyed the last few fights, especially the one against Gortash. Everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this playthrough. I know I have, and if you did enjoy this video, I would appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos by me, subscribe to the channel. Until next time. Design once again ended by my line. The brain is on the cusp of its final thought, and it's taking all of Orpheus's strength to keep it there. An opportunity, perhaps. You glimpse the lifelong destiny promised by your father. Enslave, dominate, ruin. In your father's name, you must seize your rightful claim to the brain, not destroy it. If you do not, then he will flay and shred your mind, so it cannot even comprehend the horrors he will plague you with. I know what you're thinking. So let's do it. Let's seize the whole damn world and be reviled together.
Gake, what do you think you're doing? In 